Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast for December 14th, 2023. My name is Mark Hillary and I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm in Peter Ryan in Planet Hoth, otherwise known as Montreal, Mark, where it is freezing cold and it looks like a snowball outside. But, you know, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, to quote one of the very famous songs that's playing around this time. You know, for me, I always say the Christmas season never really starts in, in my head until the first time I hear Wonderful Christmas Time by Paul McCartney. And I have yet to actually hear that played either in a store or anything on one of the radio stations I listen to online. But it is the festive season and we're coming to the end of the year. And I think a good way to finish off is with a previous guest and a longtime friend of the podcast, Mr. Adrian Swinsko, who is the head of Punk CX. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you know, I mean, if I worked in retail, then I would definitely rather be listening to some punk rather than uh, endless Christmas music. I did, in fact, hear Paul McCartney in a supermarket yesterday. Uh, so and and it made me think instead of feeling Christmassy, it just made me think I'm glad I don't work here and have to listen to this all day. Yeah, it's, it's painful. And uh, it's funny because I was in the Philippines just in in September, not long after uh, my birthday, which is the early part of that month. And I was blown out of the water that already hotels and stores had the Christmas decorations out. You know, Christmas has not just become a a couple of weeks or a month, it's become like an entire season. Some countries, it's become a very big season. But as we finish off our Christmas season, or we get into our Christmas season and finish off the year mark, you know, I think Adrian's got some really interesting thoughts just in regards to the extent to which enterprises should consider how they are working with their CX partners, whether technology players or outsourcing players. And he's able to fill us in, I think, quite succinctly on some of the dynamics about how this is evolving, how these relationships are changing, the the extent to which uh, enterprise no longer values a contract with a provider, but they're looking for a partner. And we, we've heard this a lot for a, a number of years, but I really think when it comes to this, the rubber's hitting the road. Yeah, I think that if we go back to last week's episode where we were talking to Southeastern Trains, they were very happy to talk about teleperformance and, and saying that, you know, we work with teleperformance because we are not the experts in building that kind of service, you know, so they see them very much as a partner, not not as a supplier that they're just paying cash to. So, so you know, it's like they are the kind of eyes and ears for the future of CX. And in fact, I think that that's that's pretty much what they said, you know. So it's very much around this ethos that that Adrian's sort of bringing in with his um, punk CX approach. That, that, you know, we need to sort of tear up the rule book, really, and say, you know, this is not a supplier-client kind of relationship. We, we really need to be talking about partnerships. Unless you're talking about partnerships, you're irrelevant in the industry. And what I, I find really frustrating from my own standpoint, Mark, is you see these tricked out flashy websites from so many CX operators who talk about the partnership model, who talk about how they're so engaged and and want to be a part of their client's business. But the reality is they're only going after workstations. They're just trying to sell as many workstations as they possibly can. The the discussion around innovation and integration in, in a partnership really doesn't mean that much. And I'm really glad to hear the teleperformance is being name checked in the regard of being able to manage that for a train operator, because that's great validation of an organization that's really taking this ethos to heart. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, as we sort of go forward into next year, um, we will need to start seeing some different approaches to RFPs and, and contract pricing. And like you're saying, uh, it's too simplistic now to just sell FTE workstations. Uh, you know, we really need to be sort of looking at the entire value over the next five years of this contract rather than just saying we're selling uh, 250 FTEs. Yeah, this is it. And, you know, this is what I love about talking to somebody like Adrian. It's somebody who thinks completely out of the box, much as that's a cliche that, that's been going around the last 20 years, but he does. It's It's about... Things can be done differently. Why aren't we doing them differently? And as you referenced uh, a few minutes ago, the, the fact of the matter is there is a whole 
different way of undertaking CX work. There's a whole different way of, of modeling how the best CX outcomes can be delivered. Why aren't more organizations that are offering services to enterprises thinking about this and being proactive? So this is where we're going into 2024. And if we go to our interview with Adrian, we're going to get a lot of insight about what the BPO community could be doing and should be doing better, as well as what enterprises need to be thinking about when they're looking for a partner. Okay, so let's go straight to the interview with Adrian Swinsco from Punk CX. It's the last interview of the year. Next week, we'll just be you and I talking about highlights of 2023. I'll bring the champagne. The CX Files is really excited to welcome back a longtime friend of our podcast, and that is Mr. Adrian Swinsco, who joins us from his base of operations in one of my favorite parts of the world, Edinburgh, Scotland. So, Adrian, great to see you. Hey, Peter. Nice to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And as I mentioned, the last time you were on the show, this is when you and I were bantering before I hit the record button, was nearly four years ago. And you know, over the course of that time, obviously, there's been a lot of shifts and a lot of changes. When you spoke to Mark Hillary in February of 2020, that was right before the P word. And Blimey. yeah, I know, I know. But I will say that it's it's a real honor to have you on. And I will say for full disclosure, I think the name of your company, Punk CX, is probably one of the coolest corporate <laughs> monikers I have ever heard in my life. Well, you know, it's a... Uh... I sort of adopted it after the book that came out in 2019, which was, um, which sort of looks like this. Um, and um, it just became a thing, but it's also a license for me to kind of, that, that, that allows me to sort of throw my arms around my increasingly kind of cantankerous kind of nature. And so like I can, I can, I can be direct and kind of call things out. Cause I don't need to kind of like, I don't need to tiptoe around things. No, I think some no, of the stuff that we talk about, I think, is a little bit too important. We should get a hurry up. I tend to agree with you. I, I don't like the tiptoeing around either. And this sort of goes back to what you and I had been chatting a little bit about again prior to hitting the record button. But I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into it and direct thoughts, direct messages from yourself are very much appreciated on this podcast. So Adrian, let's talk a little bit about the whole issue as we are are leaning into 2024 and you see i use the word leaning because we, you again you and i had been referencing that expression mm -hmm. as we go into the new year as we think a little bit about how enterprises and organizations that are, are dedicated to trying to ensure the best possible service the best possible interactions for end users whether digital or whether using voice what do you think their providers, whether it's the outsourcing community or the tech community, need to be thinking about as they look to try and lean into these relationships to, I wouldn't say necessarily have contracts with enterprises, but but really be partners with enterprises to ensure the best outcomes? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I'd take your, um, your last word and I would emphasize that i would take outcomes and i'd be outcomes 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 and it's not i know i wouldn't say outcomes in that traditional outsourcing contract sort of sla type of kind of uh, thing i mean outcomes that that matter outcomes that matter for customers outcomes that matter for your people and outcomes that matter for your business and that should be the frame that we're all focused on. That it's almost a bit like that should be the beach ball that we put in the middle of the table and we're all gathered around looking at that going, fine, what does that mean for us? Because I think there's changes. I mean, it's, I think the environment, we see the environment and I think the research is not great around how where standards are at right now. You know, customers, yes, they've got rising expectations, but the research suggests that that standards are slipping across the across the board. You know, customers are not getting the service or the experience that they really can like they really want. Brands are not delivering against the things that they they profess that they kind of care about or that they want to they want to do. And I think that's a that that happens because of a number of different things. But I think in order to solve those. I think the organizations and their people 
have to figure out a better way of working more closely, both with their outsource, their outsourcers, their BPOs, plus also their tech vendors. <laughs> to really figure out what is it that can have, what are these outcomes that we need to do and how are we going to, going to go about it? What is the experience that we want to deliver and what is it going to take to do that rather than just buying a whole bunch of stuff and then hoping it kind of like solves a problem and everything goes away. And then, you know, we can knock off early from work on a Friday and go for a drink, you know? Um, it's like, this is serious and it's hard work and it takes time. Um, and I can envisage, and I wrote something about this recently where I spoke to uh, a couple of execs at an outsourcer and they were talking about the things that they've been seeing in the outsourced sort of market and and how they were seeing kind of feeling rumblings that the outsourcing business was going to start to grow or it was, was going to continue to grow and that brands would and organizations would increasingly become reliant on their outsourcing par partners for like three big reasons one they were going to be looking to their outsourcers or their to deliver increasingly technical services everything from Gen AI, RPA, cyber, all of these, all these type of things. The second thing is, as they grow, they want they're, they're going to need linguistic or lingual diversity. So they're going to need to service their customers across the piece. And then the the third one is that they're going to want to them to take on an increasing amount of their back office systems because here's, and this makes sense. And the reason why it makes sense is that if we think about technology as it matures and self-service facilities as it matures and everything else, and as we we're able to provide customers with the, the resources to self-serve, and we can automate something that people can self-serve, then as many people will be talking about, it, and then that as the the nature of queries that come into an organization when people seek help become more complex, more complicated, more urgent, et cetera, et cetera there'll be a higher likelihood that they're going to need to reach into some of the back office areas to access the expertise, the knowledge and the systems in order to, to solve those, those sort of things. So having that closing close or a closer working relationship, more of a partnership, as you say, rather than a contractual thing that's driven by SLAs, but, but more of a partnership model where you are focused on delivering those outcomes, but also not just delivering financial kind of be, be financially re rewarded, but also kind of looking and seeking out value creating opportunities. I think that's be, uh, that's going to become increasingly important, which then becomes a challenge for the outsourcers because it might be that the outsourcer ends up having to think about innovating, which might result in them cannibalizing their own business for a short period of yeah. time. Yeah. And for some people, they'll be like, oh, they'll, I'll be, some people will be listening to this who are in the outsourcing game and be like, well, I understand that in theory, but I'm not really sure I like the side of that in practice. You know, and that's going to be a big challenge to be able to just going to be, it, it's going to, because it's a change of mindset. You have to kind of play the long game rather than kind of the, this financial, quarterly driven sort of mindset, as it were. And I think that's going to be, it's going to, I think it's going to suit some of the more entrepreneurial fir firms, but it might exclude some of the firms that don't necessarily have the the technical capability or the financial kind of wherewithal to be able to take those that sort of route. It may also catch out some of the bigger players who are just being stuck in their ways, and it's like, yeah, we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of seats. It's just like we are drinking from the from the fountain right now we're getting drunk on the fountain and it's just like too hard to leave or to change um so i don't know how quickly this change is gonna is gonna happen but the problem is is already happening yeah and we're already seeing it and so it will start to get bigger and grow kind of uh, more and and so i think there's there's a change coming um and some people just won't do it, but actually, this is the interesting thing that comes out of all the, all of this is that many will stick with the status quo or will hold on to the status quo as long as possible. But then that creates an opportunity for 
other players and other brands and other organizations to zag while everybody else is zigging and create clear blue water between yeah. them and create that differentiated service and experience that we all know that people want to you know want want to receive and brands want to deliver okay so let's pick this up on a couple of different angles because you've given me a, a couple of areas for thought over the course of what you've just said i want to start out with the, the state of cx right now because you alluded to this a couple of seconds ago adrian the reality is, if you take a look at the Consumer Satisfaction Index in the United States, it's abysmal. If you take a look in the United Kingdom, I've seen that there are some moderate improvements that are happening, but it's still not very good compared to what it might have been four or five years ago. People, as you say, have expectations, and they anticipate that businesses from which they buy products and services are going to meet or exceed those expectations. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of rhetoric out there, no matter what the industry, about how the customer is important, how the interaction is important. But so few organizations seem willing to step up to the plate. CX budgets are being cut left, right, and center, or at the very least, they're not growing. In your opinion, do enterprises and the CX decision makers within those organizations, do they think that the public is stupid? Do they think the public's not going to catch on, that service is going down? And it, it, this is not restricted to one geography or industry. People across the board are just angry at the fact they just can't get served. Um. So let me unpick that. I mean, do I think that people, well, do I think that people talk a good game or talk a game, talk a better game than they actually play. Yes, um, there is a problem. I think that the um, the this whole the importance of uh, customer experience is become this. It's become this thing of rhetoric. Everybody has to talk the game because if you don't, they just look odd. Um, and yet, so there's what you've got to do is you've got to figure out that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors kind of going a lot of people are talking a lot of rhetoric and not a lot of action and yes i think customers are um are frustrated they are angry um many firms are showing that they're more interested actually the, the people that are, they say their customers are the most important because the people are most important and the customers are most important but actually what it's what, what it shows is that actually their investors are the most important kind of people in this mix um, but I also think some of the kind of the blame has to sit with customers too. And the interesting thing is that customers don't switch as much as they could or should. We have, we have a lot of choice for different sort of things. And yet we don't switch as much as we could do. I mean, crumbs, if you look at the, the situation in the UK, there's all sorts of facilities that supposed to make it easy for you to switch, say, banks, right? And yet hardly anybody switches banks. Yeah. Not to the level that is going to scare the bejesus out of any of the high street players. Sure. And so... If it matters to us, we have to take responsibility for it as well. Um, but I also, you know, so I think we're not, we can't, we're not absolved of any responsibility. You know, I think we have to take responsibility for that because actually if the companies, um, if we did start switching, we did start being kind of more active purchasers, as it were, um, I mean, be more discerning about where we spend our money and being willing to to undertake the effort to switch, then we might force some change. But that being said, I think organizations, I think we talked about this before. We get they get caught up in in in, in new things. Um and the some of the one of the frightening statistics. There's two actually. There was a piece of research that was done by um, Pega Systems. I think it was about two years ago. It was quite. It was really interesting because it kind of it polled customer service agents and also customers. So it was a two sided piece of research, and they, were, they asked more the the top five challenges or top five frustrations. 
Interestingly, the top frustration, the top challenge was the same for both customers and also kind of agents. And that was having to repeat yourself or having to ask the customer to repeat themselves. And then you back that out, you think about that, and you go, well, that's all related to the omni-channel thing, with, like having a connected channel kind of ecosystem. And then there was recent research that came out from Deloitte with a global contact center survey, which showed that only 7% of global brand leaders, global contact center leaders, only 7% of them said they had all of the channels integrated. And you look at it and just go, wow. I mean, I mean, I'd just stop there and go discuss, go go home, yeah. do your homework, write me fifteen hundred words on that one. And and it's sort of like you and I were saying before we we started recording when we were talking about that statistic, and I had not heard it. I think that's a very very optimistic estimate on the part of Deloitte. I I would be very surprised if it was that number. Yeah, and I, and I I checked that with um with Lee Hopwood who runs the CCMA, the Call Center Management Association here in the UK and I was speaking to her about that I said what do you think to this number and she said actually I think that's quite generous so which is in line with kind of what you're saying and so yeah we can make all sorts of excuses about kind of how hard it is legacy technology and everything else but how long Peter have we been talking about omnichannel as a thing exactly 15 years at least right and so if it, when you talk when you add that sort of dimension to it that's not legacy technology anymore. No. Because you're beyond technological cycles when you get to 15 years. That's just something else. Yeah, exactly. So, Adrian, let's flip back to talk a little bit about the, the providers, whether it's the CX providers from a technology angle or the, the actual service providers, the, mm -hmm. the outsources themselves. Um, you alluded to something about opportunities when there's a lot of companies that are choosing to do things the way they've always done it because it's convenient and it's easy. And I mean, we all fall into habits like that. And mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's the reality. But the fact is that consumers are changing where enterprises are changing in terms of those that are are just popping up verticals that didn't exist five years ago now are becoming mainstream. I'm thinking about things like digital enterprise, fintech. These are mm -hmm. ones that are desperately looking to try and engage with the BPO community. In your opinion, as we're entering a period of, or not entering, but we've been in a period of mega consolidation from the BPO or the CX services angle, what should enterprises be looking for now in terms of a partner where you, you seem to have a bifurcation where there's fewer and fewer large global players, but it seems like there's a plethora of hungry and aggressive entrepreneurial BPOs that might be considered emerging themselves or even mid-sized? Yeah, I mean, I would say that... that um... I mean, I would say that the, uh, the thing that you you need to be looking for is you're looking for rather than just a, a service provider, you're looking for a partner. And you've got to be able to look at somebody and get a sense of, you know, kind of, are they passionate for it? Do they care about what you want to do? Can they innovate? Are they willing to take some like risks at their own sort of, ex, you know, at their own expense? Are they willing to invest in the relationship? And invest in the success of the you know the brand. Are they willing to play longer term and not just be about maximizing the value of the of the contract? Yes, I know there's an economic reality and we're in it to kind of make kind of money, and that has to be a balance there. But I think it's about the nature of the um, you have to think about the you know the nature of the the relationship and the you know the mindset and the capability. Will they make a good partner? Do they like the brand? Do they understand the brand? Are they you know? Can they innovate? Can they innovate with you? Can they kind of uh, they're willing to partner kind of with you? And I think, and they're willing to, to kind of take on and do different you know different things. Are they investing in themselves? Are they investing in their own capabilities? What does their roadmap as a service provider look like? You know, I don't know if they I don't know if service providers have roadmaps, but they probably should. Which means kind of like it's almost a case of. Yeah, they might be develop, developing your own technology, but it's almost a bit like how are you going to develop your own capability over time, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I think that for me is, is a slightly different sort of um, it requires you to look at things in a slightly different different way. You have to have a different, uh, a different relationship. But there's what's exciting is, um, well, there's two. Th there's one thing that one on one hand it's depressing, and on the other hand it's exciting. And the depressing thing is that you see some of these exciting new players get started up, and they do really well, and they grow really quickly, and then they get gobbled up. They do really successful. They very successfully kind of acquire these big brand names, and they can take a very different approach to it. I can think of one that started up in in Ireland and then got acquired, and then seemed to get gobbled up. It's almost like somebody bought them for the logos, yeah. and it. Uh, um, but it's keeps happening there's still space for people to do new things and there's there's a lot of new and interesting bpos that are innovative bpos that are just that are trying to reinvent the space and try and do things kind of differently and bring on new people and, and approach it in a slightly different uh different sort of way and and a lot of it's happening in the smaller level but also in the mid-market kind of level and some of these some of these mid-market players are going to start to gain some momentum and 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 um because i think the value and the opportunity is and the um the options are already there in the markets i think the brands just need to look a little bit deeper in terms of find to because i think the partners the potentially of part the potential that potentiality of partners or i get that wrong the availability of partners i think they already exist you just have to go find them and I love what you just said about the smaller or mid-sized players developing that subject matter expertise and those capabilities, because I think that if there's one thing that I'm picking up more and more is that the buyers, the enterprises are desperately looking for organizations that I'm not going to say have necessarily the biggest breadth from a horizontal standpoint, but have a depth of understanding about their sure. industry, about the technology and you, you do raise an interesting point, though, going into 2024, the fact that we are seeing a, a fair number of smaller firms that maybe have a functional expertise or have a, a vertical level of capability that maybe a lot of firms don't have. They're prime targets to be bought up themselves. And when you get the big players coming with, frankly, very generous checkbooks, it's hard to make a case if you're the owner that maybe you might not want to consider selling. Yeah, no, that that is it's a real risk, but then it also tests tests the metal of the people that are you know the the people that are running these firms and what and why are they in it? Mm. You know, if yeah. you if you're gonna if you're gonna fold at the um, at the first sign of a reasonably reasonably big check, then you're like going, okay, fine, maybe you were just like you you it's not for you and you know you're you're willing to cash out. You're like. And that's up to you. That's absolutely fine. I personally, if you're doing something different and interesting and innovative, and it's making having an impact, then cashing cashing out kind of like then possibly feels a little bit early. Yeah, it's true. But so who am I? To, who am I to say? Because I'm not shelling <laughs> that ship, and I'm not, I don't have to turn down like a hundred million dollars to like check. Uh, I know that uh, that's it's pretty hard to, hard money to turn down, but. You know, Adrian, as we finish up our chat today, I'd like to get some thoughts from you. You know, we're obviously going into a new year. There's a lot of new and exciting things on the horizon. Thinking about the counsel you might provide uh, a buyer, an, an enterprise CX decision maker that's considering relationships, considering what they can do with third parties to help drive better CX outcomes what should they be looking at in 2024? What should the prime considerations be, whether it's the opportunities or potential storm clouds on the horizon? So I would say to people that if they're, they're buyers, I would say that the first thing I would do is I would look at yourselves. And I would say that I would get really clear on, I would ask them, to get really clear on what is the vision that they have for the experience that they want to deliver. Many people say that they have that in place. I would dispute that. I would say that most people have a, a random assemblage of a bunch of buzzwords 
kind of knit together in a sentence and that's the thing and it you know you think about it it's mostly they're mostly all the same or there variations on a theme connected seamless ai enabled digital omnichannel experience blah 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 whatever and what i would say is that i think people brands need to go deeper on that they need to get to a really granular sort of understanding about what it is they want to where they're at and what they want to deliver and the difference thereof and what it's going to take to do that and what it means for the different parts of the business or what it means for different people so they understand what they need to do in order to deliver that i think only when you get to that sort of granular level of understanding can then you really really understand what do i need and who do i need to deliver this and i think for me that's that that's the something i would ask people to think about because i don't th I, th I think because we don't really have that clear understanding we're we're not necessarily the best buyers of the technology or the services because we haven't got it fixed in our mind we're waiting for other people to to build that picture for us but we haven't got it fixed in our mind what it actually what we want to deliver perfect well Adrian Swinsco from Edinburgh with Punk CX. This has been an absolute pleasure, a great way to kick the new year off in terms of the podcast. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope we can have you on a lot sooner than four years later for the next episode. Well, thank you, Peter. And I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. I'd be delighted to come back. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week.